All right, I'm excited to be wrapping up our series today. I've enjoyed uh, preaching this series, Winning the War in Your Mind. It's been based on a book that I read a little while ago called Winning the War in Your Mind. And if you're interested in picking it up, the book goes uh, further into some of these concepts that we've talked about, about neural pathways and all these various things. It's a great kind of uh, combination of what Scripture says and what we've learned from science about the mind and how to overcome. It's a great book <clears throat> that sounds like a heavy read, but it's not. It's a pretty easy read. It's, it's, you can grasp it really easily. Uh, you can grab the audio book and, and listen to it on your way to and from work or whatever. I would encourage you to pick it up if you're serious about continuing to win the war in your mind. Because winning the war in your mind is not something that we just, all right, it's done and it's over and now I've won. No, we have an enemy that until we go to heaven, he's always working. He's always fighting. And so this winning the war in your mind thing is an ongoing battle. It's an ongoing fight. And so I would encourage you once, twice a year to pick up some literature, read some scriptures, memorize some stuff that will help you stay sharp, keep winning those wars, keep pulling down those strongholds. And it's important not just for this series, but that we commit, that you and I commit personally to the future self, to our future selves, that we're going to Keep reading and keep learning and keep overcoming, keep studying scripture, keep going to God, keep devoting. And it's important that we keep trying to win those wars in our mind because the reality is, and you've heard me say this now for four weeks, but most of life's battles are won or lost in your mind. Most of them. We, 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 we win or lose battles up here before we win or lose battles out here. So you can't get lazy or careless with what's going on between your ears. Because if you get careless up here, eventually your life is going to look like what your thoughts look like right now. There's good news if that sounds scary. You have all the tools and all the weapons to overcome, to demolish strongholds right there in the Word of God. Come on, somebody. Right there in the Word of God. You have everything you need. That is not an old, dry, dusty book. That is the living, breathing Word of God. And it's powerful. It has divine power to tear down strongholds in, a, in the near future. I, I'm really convicted uh, just personally as a preacher. Like, I, we're about to go. I'm not going to do it all the time, but I'm going to take 12 weeks. It's going to take 12 weeks. I've been looking at the book of 2 Timothy, and I'm going to preach verse by verse through 2 Timothy. We're going to take some breaks because <laughs> 12 weeks is a long time. And, and you know, and I'm, I'm actually taking it easy on myself because I really want to do the book of Romans. But you, you start looking at that, that's like a year, two years, and I'm going to get tired of Romans. You're going to get tired of Romans. But as I was reading through 2 Timothy this week, kind of looking where, okay, where could we divide it up? Oh, that's a mess. That's a mess. You know, uh, 12 of them in those four chapters. But anyway, in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. From the stuff like from the, he's the son of this one, and this one lived 100 years, all the way to the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. None of it is minor. None of it is lacks power. All Scripture is God-breathed, and it is useful. And Paul lists all reasons why it's useful. What I want you to know and remind you of is when you get lost, when you get overcome, your first turn should be to the Word of God. It is divinely powerful. All of it is useful. All of it is powerful to help you overcome. It can transform your mind, renew your mind, help you create new neural pathways of truth. The, the Word of God is powerful. So lean on the Word of God because, again, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. The life you live is a reflection of the thoughts you think. And so it's important that we have the Word of God renewing our minds, renewing our thoughts, giving us truth to think about instead of the lies that uh, we so often uh, sometimes accept as truth. Anyway, that's kind of all preamble. I want to jump into the message today. And if you would, uh, join me in standing up. Let's stand to honor the Word of God. We're going to read our opening passage, pray, and then we're going to get into a message we're calling Calm Your Anxious Mind. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, quick verses. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every, somebody say every. every. 
That word in the Greek is every, right? <laughs> every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. And he gives us the results. If we can refuse anxiety and instead go to God in prayer, he says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth in your word, for the weapon that we have in your word. It is divinely powerful to tear down strongholds, to to rip down opposing thoughts and oppositional forces. I pray in Jesus' name that we would walk out of this place today better, stronger, with more faith, with more courage because of time together, time in worship, and time in your word. May we commit, Lord, not just for this series, but for the rest of our lives until we see you in heaven to win this war in our mind, to keep fighting the good fight. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen and amen. Hey, before you sit down, look over at your neighbor and tell them, get your mind right, get your mind right. All right, you may be seated. Now, Paul tells us to do something there that sounds utterly impossible. He he tells us to do something that we think we have really no control over. And that is, he gives us this command. It's not advice. It's not, you know, Scripture is, is long on commands and short on advice, right? Uh, he's not giving us advice. He's, he's, it is wisdom, but it's, it's a command. Paul is saying, don't be anxious. Don't. He's not saying it would be good or it would probably be nice. It would probably help your marriage. All that's true, but he's saying, don't be anxious. Oh, Chase, you don't know what I got going on. I don't. I, Paul said it, not me. I'm just saying what Paul said. He said, don't be anxious. Yeah, 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 but I got, a, I got finals coming up, and I got to get my GB. Don't be anxious. Yeah, but I got more bills than money right now, and don't be anxious. Yeah, but my teenager just started driving, and every time they leave that, don't be anxious. Come on, somebody. Yeah, but my spouse is driving me nuts. Don't be anxious. About what? About anything. About anything. Now, Paul, we're not going to get into it now. We may get into it when we eventually get to 2 Timothy, but Paul had a lot of reason to be anxious himself, right? We talked about prison in Philippians, but he had more than that. You know, Paul was a volunteer preacher. He didn't do this for a living. You know what Paul did for a living? He made tents. That's what Paul did for a living, and he was a volunteer preacher and scripture writer. Paul had other stuff going on other than, he didn't just, he wasn't like some rich man who sat around writing the Bible. He, he lived a real life, he planted churches, he had friends that turned on him, he had people that opposed him, his presence stirred up riots in a few different cities. Paul had a lot going on. Not to mention he had to make a living so he could volunteer preach. And so when we come to Paul, yeah, yeah, but this, that, and that, Paul's like, I get it, I know, man, I got a lot going on too, but hear me, hear me, hear me, you have more control over this than you think you do. And he says, with that control, don't be anxious about anything. Now, why do we feel so often that we have no control over things like anxiety and depression and panic and fear and worry? Why do we feel that? Well, we could say they're neural pathways, or we could say that they're strongholds in our mind, and all that's true. That's what we've been saying for the last three Sundays. But it also has to do with the way your brain is made. There is, and I'm not a doctor, but go Google it later, make sure I'm telling it right, right? Uh, There's a a little almond-shaped, almond-sized portion of your brain called the amygdala the amygdala, and it's right there. It's just a little tiny portion right there at the center and the base of your brain. Now, the amygdala, if you've taken an anatomy course or anything, you'll know is the little center in your brain that is wired to panic. It's wired for for like your fight or flight mechanism. So your amygdala is a blessing because if you're ever like out in the woods walking, why would you be out in the woods walking? I don't know, maybe you're crazy, but you're out in the woods walking and you walk up on a snake. Your amygdala says, run! 
and your hair stands up on the back of your neck and you start freaking out, you get goosebumps and you're moving faster than you ever thought you could because the amygdala shoots a jolt of adrenaline all through your body and you are gone. Have you ever been in a dangerous situation and you reacted like in a good way, in a positive way to get yourself to safety and after the fact you're thinking, God, what happened? I, don't, I just went into like auto mode. Well, that was your amygdala working saying this is scary, this is bad, this, you better panic, you better fight, or you better flight. The other day, I was driving, we have, we have a, a, a little Civic and we have an SUV, and I was driving the little Civic the other morning when it was raining hard. It's coming to the church. Well, there's several, like, two-lane roads by my house, and I got to one portion, and I couldn't see the stripes on the road anymore, and, and you know, I'm from Texas. We try anyhow, but as, as I... I slowed down and I tried to, and I went. And as I'm driving slowly, I just feel those hairs. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you're gonna, you're gonna end up in the ditch. Oh my God, this car's about to float. Oh my God, the engine just made a funny sound. Is it getting water? You know, that's what I'm doing. It's maybe 10 seconds before I got past this little section, but in my mind, I'm just, it's going 100 miles a minute. And I've got this panic happening. Uh, <laughs> Lord, I'll tell you one too close to home. This morning I was in the office getting ready and Ellis just kind of walks around this place like he owns it. He's up here, you know, three, four days a week. So he just walks around and I was in the restroom back there and I didn't realize he'd walked in and I opened a cabinet just this morning and I heard bow hard. Oh my God, I looked down, dropped everything, picked him up and I'm like, like feel like a dog, you know. He didn't even cry, but I just, oh my God, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so, and, and uh, just take over. I dropped it. I walked back in the restroom a minute later. I dropped everything that I had in my hands. What happened? Something scary happens. Your amygdala kicks in. And that's a good thing, right? When it's a snake or whatever it may be. If your alarm goes off in the middle of the night, what happens? You, you jump up, grab the baseball bat, right? You grab, grab the gun, whatever it may be, because you're thinking, all right, somebody's in the house. Your amygdala is saying, you're about to die unless you hop up and get to work. But, but here's the problem, or there's several problems with the amygdala. It's a good thing in dangerous situations, but, but, but it thinks every situation is dangerous. So all the amygdala knows how to do is respond with alarms and panic and worry and anxiety. All the amygdala knows how to do when you perceive danger or something going in a negative direction, all the amygdala knows how to do is flash sirens. And it responds to what we, what we would call like pre-programming. So those strongholds, you had a bad experience when you were a kid with, with, with whatever. I got bit by a dog whenever I was a kid. I still don't like dogs. And I know why, because I was walking to somebody's house when I was a kid. Their dog bit them, ran to it, bit my leg, done with dogs. Every time I see a dog, little dogs, big dogs, mean looking dogs, sweet looking dogs, I remember that bite on my leg and I think, nope, 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 get away from me. And, and it's, it's legit. I don't, it's not that I dislike animals, but I got bit once when I was a kid. I'm done. And my amygdala says, you better run. It's going to bite you. Oh, it doesn't bite. It'll bite me. That, you know, there's that pre-programming from an experience or maybe from a preference or whatever it may be, your amygdala response. Whereas you might see a dog and your amygdala doesn't go crazy because you didn't have the same experience or you grew up with them, you know, sleeping in the bed with you, which is gross, but you grew up sleeping with them, sleeping in the bed with you, but... <laughs> and so yours doesn't tell you the same thing. What I'm saying is the amygdala is dumb. It does a good job when, it, when you need it to, but it's dumb. It doesn't have much logic. It's kind of a drama queen. It thinks everything is bad all the time. It's not objective. It's not logical. It is hardwired to panic. It's hardwired to protect. And when it's doing that, it does a really good job of that. And that's why God gave it to us. He gave us that little amygdala for protection. But he didn't only give us that, he gave us something else, which is the polar opposite of the amygdala that is designed to keep the amygdala in check, and that is the prefrontal cortex. Whereas the amygdala is the panic center of your brain, the prefrontal cortex is the logic center of your brain. So when the alarm goes off in the middle of the night and your amygdala says, hop up, 
grab the bat, come out of the room swinging, or else we're all going to die. The prefrontal cortex says, no, one of the kids probably went out to the garage for a Coke. Let me go check. Or the cat set off the emotion, the emotional, you know, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex is always trying to balance out and calm down the amygdala. Do you have anybody like that in your life that you're always having to calm down? Like, hey, just chill, just chill, just chill, just chill, just, just, just no, they didn't mean, they didn't mean it, they didn't mean that, they didn't mean it, just chill, you just, or maybe you're that person, right, your spouse or your family member is always trying to calm you down, like, just, just, it's not that big a deal, just don't make a big deal out of it. That's what the prefrontal cortex is always trying to do, the amygdala. Just, just, let's, there's probably a good explanation. Let's just find out what it is before you go nuts. And, and this is the relationship that's going on in your brain. When danger or not even real but perceived danger pops up, uh, maybe because of pre-programming or preferences or a stronghold or a neural pathway or whatever it may be, when that danger pops up and the amygdala goes crazy, your prefrontal cortex is trying to say, no, there's probably a good explanation. And you know what? Nine times out of ten, there's normally a good explanation, right? And so Paul, I don't know that he knew all of this about the brain, but God made the brain and the Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul to write. We actually see the relationship between these two parts of your brain in the words we just wrote. Paul says, don't be anxious. There's your amygdala working. Don't be anxious about anything. He's saying use the prefrontal cortex. Use the logic portion of your mind to tell the panic portion of your mind what to do. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation... Watch what he says, by prayer and petition. You know, you know what prayers, we talked about meditating. It, it's, it's, it's a lot of times taking the situation and just saying, God, I need your mind on this. How should I be seeing this? God, and, and allowing your logic center to calm down your panic center. So he says, instead of panicking, go to God, talk out your thoughts, right? Get the mind of God, get the mind of Christ. What he's saying is, pray about everything. And what will happen is this prefrontal cortex while you're praying is going to calm down that amygdala. Pray about everything. But here's the problem. When we're panicking, when we're like afraid, we're not thinking, okay, well, let me stop and pray. And you know what? In dangerous situations, maybe just act. But every situation, like the meeting you have tomorrow at 10 a.m. that you're nervous about or anxious about is not a dangerous situation. So don't go into that situation on 10. Pray about it. If a dog runs at you with intentions to bite, go crazy, run. But don't go crazy in your meeting tomorrow morning. You know it's coming. Take the time to pray about it and let this front portion of your brain Calm down that other portion of your brain. But we tend to when we're panicking or when we're angry or when we're anxious or when we're worried, when, we, when the amygdala is going nuts, we tend to drastically downgrade the power of prayer. No, 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 I'll pray later. Right now I got to do something. And once we do everything we think we can do, then we say all we can do now is pray. And what we forget is prayer is powerful. It's, it's not the last thing we can do. Okay, God, bless all the stuff I've done. No, no, no. I'd rather pray on the front end, find out what God wants me to do, get the mind of Christ on the front end, then mess it up further and then hope God just blesses my screw up. You know what I'm saying? All we can do now is pray. No, no, no. That is a divine weapon with divine power. Imagine this, the God of the universe, the one who spoke and the world came into being, wants you to speak to him and he wants to speak into your situation. I don't know if we ever think about this. God spoke and the world was. Well, why can't he speak and change your world? If we believe that God spoke, John 1.1, 1, 1, Genesis 1.1, 1, if we believe that in the beginning, right, God, there was only God, there was nothing else, and he created the world with a word, well, Lord, 
you need to be talking to that guy. If, if you had a situation, you know, take spiritual things out of it, but you knew of somebody that could just say a word and change your financial situation, somebody with a lot of money or somebody with a lot of pool or somebody that could get your kid into the college or somebody that could get you a promotion, w wouldn't you want to go talk to them and just see if they might be interested in speaking on your behalf? What I'm saying is we downgrade the most potential uh, the most potent weapon that we have, and that is the voice of God speaking into our situation. When we avoid prayer, we miss not just saying what we're saying to God, but we miss Him saying what we need Him to say about our situation. He can change everything with a word. Your world can change in one word from God. Prayer is not our last line of defense. It is our first line of offense. It's a weapon. It is a tool. And I would strongly encourage you to increase your prayer life. Well, Chase, I pray a lot. Pray more. Every Monday night at 7, we have prayer in here for an hour. I'd encourage you to come. If it's hard for you to find time to pray, just make an appointment. Every Monday night, 7 to 8, right here in this room, come and Pray. Yes. Hebrews 4.16, the writer of Hebrews says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence yes. so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Pray about everything. Yeah, Chase, but you don't understand the situation. Maybe you can get the favor of God on that situation. Maybe you could get the mercy of God. Maybe you could find grace to help you in that situation. Hey, the half-brother of Jesus, James, said it this way, you have not because you don't ask. Some of us, we just need to open our mouth. And say, God, I've done everything in my power, and it hasn't gotten me anywhere. I'm going to stop depending on myself first and you last and depending on you first. Power of prayer on two levels. Number one, prayer moves the heart of God. Prayer moves the heart of God. You ought to go read a story about Abraham and Lot. Abraham praying, no, 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 there's godly people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't destroy the city. God had intentions to destroy that whole city and everybody in it, but Abraham had family there, and he's talking to God. He's praying. He's saying, no, 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 change your mind, God. Change your mind. There's good people there. There's good people there. And eventually, the cities are destroyed, but Abraham's family is saved. What I'm saying is, and Abraham proves to us in Scripture and all Scripture is God breathed, that prayer can move the heart of God. See, you can be barreling towards some disaster, and maybe God is going to allow it, and you pray, and you have then because you asked. God changes it. The heart of God changes. Something moves, and somebody's rescued. Somebody's saved. Some, somebody is spared. Who knows what it may be? Pray about everything. Pray about stuff you don't, you're not even sure God cares about. He does, but you're not even sure if he cares. Just say it. Pray about it. Because prayer, number one, moves the heart of God. But here's what I want you to see. Prayer changes the chemistry in your brain. We've talked about neural pathways and how thinking thoughts make them easier to think again, whether good thoughts or bad thoughts. Well, there, there's a whole study in... Neuroscience is called neurotheology, and it's all about how uh, prayer and spiritual things literally affects the makeup of your brain. And whether you know this or realize this or not, your brain is always changing. Doctors used to believe that after adolescence, your brain was locked like cement, but it's not true. It's always changing. It's always taking shape and forming in different ways. And here's what uh, an author and, and Christian, Dr. Caroline Leaf, she wrote in her book, Switch on Your Brain, she said, it's been found that 12 minutes, 12 minutes, you got 12 minutes. Wake up 12 minutes earlier. It's been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer, don't miss those two words, daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can literally change the brain to such an extent that the change can be measured on a brain scan. Daily focus, 12 minutes a day, 
every day for eight weeks. 56 days in a row, I think. That was quick math on the spot with a couple hundred people watching me. 56 days in a row. What, what could your life look like 60 days from now? How many of us can say that, man, you know what, I have met that mark. Maybe some, but probably not most of us have really like solid 10, 12, 15 minutes a day every day over an eight-week period. And yet we say, oh, prayer doesn't work. I've done all that. You know what it is? It's small, small deposits of time over time that make the biggest difference. See, it's just 12 minutes. You got 12 minutes. But it's daily. It's focused. Phone's away. I'm locked in. Kids are asleep, whatever it may be. It's daily. It's focused over, over an extended period of time. It changes your life. That's how you lose weight. That's how you get in shape, right? It's not the one salad. That's always been me, right? I eat the one salad and go jump on the scale and then get mad that the one salad didn't do the trick and drive through Whataburger and get my patty melt with a large fry and a Dr. Pepper shake. <laughs> and if it's 11, throw me an HBCB. You know what I'm talking about, honey butter chicken biscuit. Go ahead and throw one of those in there too. <laughs> and then say, oh, them salads and stuff, that doesn't work. Well, it's not the one salad, right? It's, it's, it's eating healthy day after day after day after day over an extended period of time. It's for those of you that work out a lot, right? It's not the one time you hit the gym that changes your world. It's doing it every day for the next year that's really going to show. It's, it's not the four-hour workout. It's the 30-minute workout you do every day, right? Same thing with prayer. You know, we get into a crisis situation. We're like, okay, i got to pray for the next hour. i got to pray for the next two hours. But then we don't pray again until the next crisis, well, prayer doesn't work. No, no, no. It works just the same as everything else in our life works. It's those small deposits over time that make the difference. Twelve minutes a day, seven days a week, for eight weeks can literally change your brain so that a doctor can see the difference on a scan. That's insane. But you know what? It makes sense because God created you. And he created you to be in relationship with him. When you are not in relationship with God, nothing about you, including your brain, is functioning the way God intended. Nothing about, when you're outside of a relationship with God, nothing functions right. And just as toxic, negative thoughts hurt your brain and develop these neural pathways that make it easier to keep thinking negative thoughts and all these strongholds are built in your mind, prayer heals and transforms and renews your mind literally, literally. So why do we worry then? Why do we worry if God's given us this prefrontal cortex that's supposed to calm down the amygdala and, and, and if we pray, we're, we're not going to have anxiety, why do we still have anxiety? Well, science would say we're experiencing an amygdala hijack. So your prefrontal cortex is trying to say, no, 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 it's not that big of a deal. It's just the dog. It's just the cat that drove, you know, ran by the motion sensor. But our amygdala every now and then is powerful enough to overpower the logic in our prefrontal cortex, hijack our brain, and have us living in this panic, living in this anxiety, living in this worry, which is going to give you high blood pressure, going to give you heart pressure, going to give you all of this stuff because it's not just an emotional thing happening. No, your body is telling your body to, your brain is telling your body to panic. And when you worry, your body's hurting. Because you're being hijacked by something that's not supposed to take the lead. So science would say your amygdala is hijacking your brain and eventually will harm your body. Adrenaline's good in a small dose, but it's not good all day, every day, right? Scripture would say when we worry, when we're overcome by anxiety, fear, all these kinds of things... Our mind is dominated by sinful thinking. That's what, that's what Scripture would say. 
What is worry after all? It's distrusting the power of God. Because if we trusted the power of God, we wouldn't worry. Like, I know God's got it. I know he's got it. Well, then what's there to worry about? When we worry, it's because we're letting the sinful nature control our mind. And I'm not saying you're bad if you do. I'm saying you're human if you do. But that's why we need scripture. That's why we need preaching. That's why we need to study. That's why we need to get in, like, learn. Because there are ways to overcome, but we got to know what's going on, right? But instead of letting that sinful nature control our minds, Paul tells us in Romans 8 to let the Spirit direct our thinking. Romans 8, 5, and 6. He says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Some of us, our mind is set on worldly things, earthly things, negative things, toxic things, unhealthy things. But those who live and according with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Now, this sounds a little bit disjointed from everything we've been talking about. But remember our overarching points that every battle in your life is won or lost in your mind. So Paul says people who live a life dominated by sin, they have a mind dominated by sin. But people who live a life according to the Spirit, they have a mind that is set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. And so again, and this is kind of what we've been building at this whole series, where is your mind set? Is it only on earthly things? Is it only on the next bill or the next thing or the next party or the next meal or the next, not even bad things, just earthly things, temporary things? Where is your mindset? On spiritual things or earthly things or even sinful things? (laughs) Here's a different kind of question. Is your amygdala leading or is your prefrontal cortex saying, okay, I know you're panicking, but, but this is what the Word of God says. See, that's a function of your logical brain. Well, if I believe this, then I don't have to obey this over here. If I believe that God is in control, then I'm not going to panic like the amygdala wants me to panic. So who's lead, which portion of your brain is leading? Paul says, take every thought captive. Make it obedient to Christ. That is literally, in the makeup of your brain, the function of the prefrontal cortex to grab a hold of the the, the crazy overreactor and say, chill, calm down. We trust God. We believe in God. And, and, you know, you might have to remind yourself every now and then, no, you know what, I trust God. I trust God. Chase, that's, that's fine, but what about those real worries? Steve Michael, he's right over here, and I'll embarrass him, but he's driving. Freaks me out. He's a good driver, great driver. Needs to brake a little sooner when he sees brake lights, but other than that, he's a great driver. But you know what? It, it freaks me out. He's, you know, he's like my own, right? Like, just because you're seeing, and I know how I drove at 16. I got my license on January 9th. Uh, what year was that? 2001. January 9th, 2001. And my first accident, January 18th, 2001. <laughs> I didn't make it two weeks. It wasn't bad, but, you know, I try to tell them parking lots. It's parking lots. It's always parking lots. People pretty much obey on the roads, but they don't obey in the parking lot. And so there's real anxiety, there's real worry. The amygdala says, oh my God, oh my God, it's raining. It's, oh my God, oh my God, where is it? It's, it's raining. Surely he's not out with some other kid driving. Where, where are they? No, let, let's, let's talk to God about it. Let me not get on his phone and make him panic more, right? You got real worries about your future. About your health. If you got a bad report, scary report, and all the plans that you have, now they look in jeopardy. Well, it's easy to say 
don't let your amygdala hijack. It's easy to think, say don't think about that, but it's really hard to do in practice. And this is where we need the help of God. Because it is. It is. It, it's too hard. When you love somebody enough, it's too hard to not worry. It's too hard when somebody gives you life and death news to not think about death and, and think about what could be lost. That's why we need the help of God. I'm not, I'm not asking you to do the impossible. This is why. This is why Scripture tells us, cast your cares upon him. He cares for you. And, and I, I love the second half of that verse, especially because it tells me two things. And one of them may be, I may be reading something that, you know, the original writer didn't intend, but they both comfort me. You know, cast your cares on him for he cares for you. Well, I read that two ways. First way I read that is he cares for me. Like he loves me. He, like he loves me. He, he don't want me to panic. He doesn't want me to worry. He, do, he doesn't want me to carry burdens that I, I don't have to carry because he loves me. It's like if you have children or if you have somebody you love and they keep putting stuff on them that they don't need to carry and you don't want them to carry, wouldn't you say, like, give me some of that stuff. Let, let's balance that out. I don't want you to ruin your life, waste your life, run yourself down carrying burdens that you don't need to carry. Well, God is a father that loves you. And so he ca says, cast your cares on me because I don't want you burdening yourself with things you're not meant to carry. You're going to waste your life. You're going to run yourself down. You're going to be ragged. So we cast our cares on him because he loves us. But then the other way I read it is he cares about those things too. Cast your cares on him for he cares. He cares about your child driving. He cares about your health. He cares about your future. He cares about your business. He cares about what you care about. And so you're not alone in your concern. And you don't have to be alone in your worry and your anxiety. It, it genuinely comes down to trust. It does. That if I believe God cares about me and about my situations, then I know all the time I'm not alone. That when I give it to him, it doesn't mean nothing's going to get done. It means that he can do what I can't do. Say, well, Chase, that sounds like, it sounds impossible. It sounds like you're in denial and you're telling us to, to go into denial. No, no, no. Here's what I'm asking you to do to calm your anxious mind. Number one, do what you can do. Right? Do what you can do. Eat right. Get enough sleep. Make sure they know how to drive. You know. Put, put them in a car that's got airbags. I mean, whatever, whatever you can do. Go to the doctor. Don't miss appointments. I mean, right? Let's be smart. Do what you can. But then number two, you got to give God what you can't do. Because you can't make cancer go away. You can't. You can't make them act right. I mean, we try, but you can't. And a lot of our frustration, a lot of our stress, and a lot of our anxiety comes from trying to do things we can't do. Trying to control people we can't control. Trying to predict outcomes that we have no control over. And that's, that's where a lot of our stress comes from. So we do what we can, but then we give God what we can't. I can't save a life. I can't change a life. I can't cure cancer. I can do everything in my power to be healthy and all of these kinds of things. I can do what the doctor says, but at the end of the day, only God can heal a body. Only God can change a heart. Only God can deliver from drugs. Only God can set free from addiction. Only God can do what only God can do. And a lot of us, we're anxious because we're trying to control things we, we're not meant to control. So we cast those cares on him. Knowing that not only does he care for us and care about the situation, but he can do something about it. 
See, you're actually, when you trust him with stuff, you're not forgetting about it and resigning to the negative. No, no, no. You're putting it in capable hands and out of incapable hands. See, your hands are incapable. When I trust God with what my hands can't do, I know that it's finally in the hands of the one who actually can make a difference here. So we do what we can, we give God what we can, and then watch this, we trust God no matter what. We go back to the six-month appointment, and it's still there. God, I've been trusting you. I've been, I've been, I gave it to you. How come it's not gone? <laughs> they pull out of the parking lot and run right into a car driving by. Didn't even look like I did. On January 18th, 2001, right out of the church parking lot too, very embarrassing because everybody's leaving the church and there I am trading insurance. We trust God no matter what. I remember that story about the three Hebrew boys in Daniel 3. The the king wants them to worship him. They won't. So he says, I'm going to throw you in a fire, kill you, I'm going to execute you. You better worship me. What do they say? These are teenagers, like children. They say, if we're thrown into the furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. If you get the diagnosis that you didn't want to get, the God you serve is able to deliver you from. If you thought they were free, but they came home drunk, and the man, they've been doing so good, but you can see it in their eyes. The God you serve is able to deliver. They said, But even if he doesn't, even if he, I know you're able, God. I don't know why sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. That's not for me to figure out. Again, that's one of those those things that's not meant for me to know. And a lot of people get angry at God, turn on God, and their life doesn't get better after that because they want to know what only God can know. You and I have to be okay with just, I'm not going to know everything. That's where trust comes in. Trust comes in when you don't know why. Because when you know why, you're not trusting. Like a parent, your kid says, why? Don't, don't, don't ask me why, because I said. And if you have parents like mine, yes, my mother too, and you were sitting in the passenger seat, that phrase was followed up quick with one of these. It was, it was one of these, one of these. My mother, she'd always, I'll pop your mouth. That's what she used to say. And I'm going to rib on her for a minute because it's her birthday today. It's her birthday today. She's watching online. And when I got older and I was more of a smart mouth and her pops on the mouth really didn't hurt at all, I would start teasing her because she never could, she didn't aim very well, you know. She'd say, I'm going to pop you in the mouth and hit you in the cheek, the nose, the eye, the forehead. Like, watch out. Turn your ring backwards or something. Don't. But it wasn't meant for me to know. What they wanted is me to just trust them because they knew more and they had better perspective and they were the parent and I was the child. See, there's a lot of things just not for us to know. And that's where we trust. God's able to deliver. And I don't know why he wouldn't, but if he doesn't, even still, I'm going to trust. I'm going to believe in every situation. And here's what Paul says. Even if the situation doesn't change, because these Hebrew guys, they were thrown into the furnace. I mean, God took a while before he delivered them. But Paul says this, don't be anxious about anything. Pray about everything. Go to God. Trust God with it. Cast your cares on him and watch this. And the peace of God. See, here's the results. Here are the results. How do you calm your anxious mind? The peace of God, which transcends understanding. Your amygdala is, ah, yeah, yeah, but this is dangerous. Yeah, this is bad. Yeah, most people die with this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your amygdala is going crazy. No, no, the peace of God which can quiet that down will 
guard your hearts, guard your minds in Christ Jesus. But here, I want you to imagine something. Imagine peace in your life. I- imagine joy in your life. Imagine uh, peace in your mind, peace in your home, peace in your family. I want you to know it's possible. But it's also a choice. We choose peace when we choose to trust God. It doesn't just happen. Bring us back to our Philippians series. We choose joy when we choose to trust God. Let me wrap this series up and then we're going to pray. Week number one, this is what we said. If you don't control what you think, you'll never control what you do. Got to start setting up a defense and an offense in your brain, right? Week number two, we said to identify the truth that demolishes the lie. Identify the truth from the Word of God. Not just a positive statement, but something from the Word of God. Write it, think it, confess it until you believe it. Romans says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You need to let yourself hear yourself speak the words of faith. Speak the word of God. Speak the word of truth. Week number three, we said you can't control what happens to you. Life is going to life. You know what I'm saying? Can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. What are you focusing on? What are you looking at? Some of us need to interpret our circumstances through the goodness of God and see that he's at work even in the worst moments of life. And today, I guess, if I just wanted to come up with a pithy statement to wrap today up, I would just say cover everything in prayer. Pray about everything. Pray about everything. 